People have been keeping time for a long time. In fact, some of our modern systems of measuring time are derived from some of the earliest civilizations. Have you ever wondered why there are 24 hours in a day? Why there are 60 minutes in an hour? 60 seconds in a minute? And 1000 milliseconds in one second? In today's modern world, the most widely used numeral system is decimal, which is known as a base 10 system, that was believed to have originated because humans found it easier to count using their fingers. But that wasn't the case everywhere. Some of the first civilizations to divide the day into smaller parts used different numeral systems. Specifically, the duodecimal system, which used base 12, and sexagesimal system, which used base 60. Most historians credit the Egyptians with being the first civilization to divide the day into smaller parts. The first sundials were simply stakes placed in the ground that helped them indicate an approximation of time by the length and direction of the resulting shadow. Yet, as early as 1500 BC, the Egyptians developed a more advanced sundial that was made in a T-shape that was used to divide the time between sunrise and sunset into 12 parts. This division reflected Egypt's use of the duodecimal system. The importance of the number 12 is typically attributed to either the number of lunar cycles in a year, or the number of finger joints on each hand excluding the thumb, making it possible for them to count to 12 with one hand. This generation of sundial was the first representation of what is now called the hour. The hours within a day were assumed to be equal, but their lengths actually varied during the year with summer hours being longer than winter hours. The night hours weren't really considered for most of Egyptian history since, like most civilizations prior to artificial light, they were limited to performing their daily activities only in the light of the sun. Although, Egyptian astronomers did propose that the night be divided into relatively equal portions of the day. They observed 12 stars that divided the night sky. They divided the night into 12 portions depending on which star was directly above. Thus, the concept of a 24-hour day was born. The problem was that their hours weren't fixed. They varied from season to season. But when Greek astronomers were starting to use time in theoretical calculations, it was proposed to come up with a standard for hours that were equal in length. Despite this suggestion, anyone who wasn't an astronomer or mathematician didn't use a fixed hour until the 16th century when mechanical clocks were first being introduced. Greek astronomers also began to consider smaller denominations of time than an hour. Hipparchus, a Greek astronomer whose work took place between 147 and 127 BC, employed techniques that he learned from studying the Babylonians who had resided in Mesopotamia. The Babylonians made all of their astronomical calculations in the sexagesimal base 60 system, which they inherited from the Sumerians, who had begun using it around 2000 BC, albeit for non-time calculations. While it is unknown why 60 was chosen, it is believed to have had something to do with the ease of expressing calculations, since 60 is the smallest number divisible by the first six counting numbers, as well as by 10, 12, 15, 20, and 30. In terms of actual timekeeping, minutes and seconds weren't really important until much later. The first clocks often divided the hour into halves, thirds, quarters, and even twelve parts in some cases, but never by sixty. It just didn't make sense for the general public to consider an hour as sixty minutes. The majority of the population being agrarian meant that the only time they regularly had to consider was the time of year and ensuring that the daylight hours were being fully utilized for the harvesting or sowing of crops. They also had a much harder time tracking divisions of time less than an hour until the invention of the mechanical clock, appearing near the end of the 16th century. Some of the first truly accurate mechanical clocks were the pendulum clocks, that used a weight that fell over the course of the day to move the gears and using a pendulum to keep the speed of the clock consistent, ticking once per second. These clocks didn't measure time perfectly, but they did come pretty close. Typically, even the early pendulum clocks were less than a minute off per day. But while the second used to be measured in terms of its relationship to an hour, i.e. one second is one thirty-six hundredths of an hour, it is now determined using one of the most accurate methods of timekeeping we've found. First, let's talk about why we need a second to be more accurate in the first place. It's because the length of a day changes very slightly over time. It can vary from year to year based on a number of factors, everything from the amount of snowfall at the poles to radiation from space hitting the planet. Not only that, but Earth's rotation is gradually slowing due to tidal forces from the moon, lengthening our days ever so slightly. 
So given enough time, our definition of what constitutes a second, minute, and hour would change if we based it on the rotation of the planet. It was in the 1950s that scientists first recognized Earth's rotation wouldn't be reliable enough to provide a standard unit of time. They decided at the time that a second should be redefined according to the length of a year, officially becoming this fraction. This definition of the second didn't last long, as even then, atomic clocks were being developed. In 1967, the 13th General Conference of the International Committee for Weights and Measures officially defined one second as the duration of 9,192,631,770 periods of the radiation corresponding to the transition between the two hyperfine levels of the ground state of the cesium-133 atom. But due to the Earth's days lengthening, our official time that we use in everyday life is adjusted according to the more accurate version recorded on the atomic clocks. Leap seconds are scheduled to be added to the official time about every 21 months to keep things mostly accurate. And while the cesium atomic clock has been the going standard for seconds ever since it was introduced, it doesn't mean it will remain that way. Future atomic clocks like the strontium atomic clock are proposed to be accurate within 1 15 billionths of a second per year, making them accurate enough to have not gained or lost a second if it had started running at the proposed time period of the beginning of the universe 13.8 billion years ago. But why does the notation of time change when it gets even smaller than one second? Faster than the flap of a hummingbird's wing, the blink of an eye, and the amount of time the human brain can process information, the millisecond is defined as one one thousandth of a second. It was created thousands of years after the concept of hours, minutes, and seconds, and thus follows the metric wording with its beginning of milli, as well as its numbering using base 10. Yet some wanted to take it a step further, replacing our current time system altogether with metric time. On March 28, 1794, the French proposed using decimal time of day. The units would make each hour one-tenth of a day, with each hour containing 100 minutes, each minute containing 100 seconds, and so on. The proposal that using the commonly accepted base 10 mathematical principles that have been adopted for measuring distances was made with good intentions. They believed it would help standardize the world's scientific process. But it would not be so easy to convince the countries of the world to convert to the new form of timekeeping from one that had been used consistently throughout history for thousands of years. Even the metric systems used for distance has not been completely adopted, as the US holds out with its use of the imperial system. Another suggestion made to ensure that all the countries of the world are on the same page is the elimination of the time zone. Two Johns Hopkins professors have proposed what they call a more rational way to run the planet. Astrophysicist Richard Kahn Henry and economist Steve Hankey argue that we should all adopt Greenwich Mean Time, also known as Universal Time. That would make it the same time everywhere. A clock reading 10 a.m. in Moscow, Idaho would be the exact same as a clock on Kangaroo Island, Australia. Everyone would know exactly what time it is everywhere at every moment, they argued, which would help facilitate conference calls and business transactions. This may seem like an odd proposal, but some countries have already made internal moves to enact similar ideas. Countries like China, who, since 1949, has only had a single time zone over the entire country, even though geographically, the country spans five. And Russia, who in 2010 abolished two of its time zones, dropping the number from 11 to 9. And they've hinted that pruning more time zones in the future is not off the table. But jumping from 24 time zones to one would be a much larger leap. On some islands in the Pacific, the date would change with the sun high in the sky. People would wake up on Tuesday and go to bed on Wednesday. The problem is that no country wants to go through the work of changing everything to universal time, only to have to go to work at 11 p.m. and go to bed every night at 2 p.m. Most people would rather just stick to the same system that they've always used. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. If you like this video, be sure to like and subscribe. It helps out the channel a lot as I try and grow it and reach new audiences, and it also helps me understand what kind of topics you like the best. Thanks again, and see you next time!